Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Ethics and Human Values Friday discussion focused on drug pricing, the law, and morality. I'm Trevor Hedberg, a postdoctoral scholar affiliated with Ohio State's Center for Ethics and Human Values and with the College of Pharmacy. The Center for Ethics and Human Values here at Ohio State is essentially our hub for respectful discussion of various issues related to public, at the intersections of public policy, political philosophy, ethics, and um, the Ohio State University and broader community. Today, we are joined by three panelists, two of which are from our own Ohio State and one who is visiting uh, us virtually from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. First, our, our featured speaker, Anne Maria um, Marciorelli. She is uh, a professor at the UMKC School of Law and got her JD from Harvard Law School. She specializes in healthcare law, regulation and finance, and she worked for many years as a healthcare, or excuse me, a health law attorney before joining the faculty at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. From the Ohio State College of Pharmacy, we have providing some comments on her presentation, Stephen Loberick, who is the assistant director uh, in, the, in the, as I said, the College of Pharmacy. He is responsible for finance, supply chain, and the 340B drug law pricing. He received his PharmD from Purdue University. And also providing comments on Anne Maria Marcia Marciarelli. Um, sorry, it's a hard name to pronounce. Um, providing on providing comments on our presentation will be John Gray from the uh, Fisher College of Business. He's a professor of operations, received his PhD from the Kennan Flagler Business School at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And prior to receiving his PhD, worked for eight years in operations at, uh, worked here for eight years in operations management at Procter & Gamble. So we're delighted to have uh, all, three of, all three of our panelists here to provide their expertise on this particular subject. For those who are new to the OSU Center C, uh, CHV webinar series, the standard format for these, uh, following these introductory remarks, um, Professor Marcia Rally will give her main presentation, which will go 15, 20 minutes. Our two commentators will provide um, short responses to her presentation. I'll then chip in a few questions for moderated discussion. And then after that, we will open things up to uh, answering questions from the audience. Now, you may notice that the chat on this video is disabled. So in order to provide questions to our speakers, we ask that you use the, the Q&A function, which is down, that should be down at the bottom of your Zoom menu. Uh, you can type in a question and that will go to me and to the other um, presenters for them that they, they can be able to see it. Uh, when we get towards the end of the talk, we'll comb through those and try to get to as many as we can within the time that we have allotted. So with these things in mind, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Marcia Relli and let her get on with her presentation. Thank you again for being here, uh, even virtually from UMKC. Thank you. Please bear with me while I share my screen. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you so much. So the first thing I want to do is make sure that you know how honored I am to have been asked to make these uh, remarks today. And I want to thank the Ohio State University Center for Ethics and Human Values, as well as Ohio State University's College of Pharmacy for this invitation. Thank you to uh, professors uh, John Gray and Stephen Laboric for uh, joining this panel. Uh, Trevor Hedberg, you have done yeoman's work. Uh, bumped by the coronavirus and the pandemic, you have made this happen. And all credit to you as well as agreeing to be our moderator today. Um, and then finally, I always wanna thank my home institution for giving me the space to think and write about these things. Sometimes ask why people ask why I made the move to the academy after 20 years in practice. I said, because I loved what I did, I was a litigator, um, but I never had a moment to think. <laughs> <laughs> People were really embarrassed by that because they're like, well, your briefs seem thoughtful, but not really to think about some of the larger implications of what I did. Why? Because it was always on to the next thing. And deciding to move to the academy, I said, you know, I've got a lot I want to say. Um, 
<laughs> and I, I think it's time in my life to say it. And so it happened. All right, finally, I'll, I'll take the sort of speaker's privilege. I hope you won't be offended. What, a, what an ambitious title, The Legal and Moral Dimensions of Prescription Drug Pricing in the United States, Talking Past Each Other or Finding Common Ground. I think I want to say some legal and moral dimensions, just trying to keep a little humility alive here. Um, and, and I guess the best place to start might be saying, so what are morals, right? I'm going to give you the working definition that I used when I put these remarks together, and I hope it's one that, that you can feel comfortable with. It's a set of standards of behavior or beliefs concerning what is and is not acceptable conduct or behavior. I myself am interested in applied ethics. This means I am peeling, interested in kind of peeling back a layer <laughs> above rhetoric to actual conduct and thinking about what is it that we really do and why is it that we really do it all within an ethical framework. So I hope that helps you kind of uh, locate yourself as it were. So nothing to disclose. Why, why do I put this slide up? I am not an MD. I am a JD. I also hold a master's in theology from Harvard Divinity School. And yes, I did obtain those simultaneously. And yes, it was a very different framework as I ran between the campuses. Um, but so, so why disclose it? That's, those are your degrees. You know, this is something typically doctors or researchers do. Well, as a reminder, as an homage, okay, to the disclosure process, in 2018, there was a wonderful study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, looking back, saying that, you know, in 2015, roughly 48% of American physicians accepted some kind of payment from a pharmaceutical or device manufacturing company. Why do I say this? Because it casts a shadow over our entire discussion, indeed over the research and scholarship behind this discussion to know that the pharmaceutical and medical device industries have even been powerful players in the very existence of certain kinds of organizations of medicine. So maybe I'd start by framing the issue. My, my questions for the day are, how are prescription drugs priced in the United States? I'll give you a whirlwind here, maybe because I'm from Missouri, but also because it's a whirlwind tour of that subject. I could not do justice to it in the time I have. The second question, is there a moral dimension to our current prescription drug pricing? And finally, is there a way for communal values to enter the public square and engage with free market values? I have been thinking about this more and more as people tend to reduce most conversations about prescription drug pricing to a kind of throwing up the hands and saying, you know, what is, is, it just is. I refuse to reconcile myself to that kind of fatalism. And I think it's dangerous, okay, for the Republic that people would think that something so terribly important is beyond public discussion and beyond public comprehension. So it is complicated, right? I give you a shot of the Fauci pharmacy. I do believe that is uh, Dr. Fauci's dad out there. I didn't know if you knew that he was a pharmacist, okay? And it was a family pharmacy. His dad was a pharmacist in Brooklyn. Uh, his mom worked inside. I think his sister worked inside as well. And he drove a bicycle and made the deliveries. Okay, I suspect that he is someone with the kind of deep personal knowledge okay, about how um, pharmaceuticals can make a difference in people's lives, um, but it's gotten a whole lot more complicated since then, right? Prescription drug pricing is complicated because prescription drug production is complicated, right? Um, pharmaceuticals, right, originate at manufacturing sites, then they are sent to wholesale distributors, then they get stocked at retail, mail order, and other types of pharmacies. Then they're subject to price negotiations and processed through quality and utilization management screens by pharmacy benefit management companies, sometimes called PBMs. And then they're dispensed by pharmacies and ultimately delivered to and presumably taken by patients, right? All of these steps along the way involve a complex series of processes as well as a complex financial arrangements for instance, I'll call out number four, where pharmacy benefit managers are, if you think about it, the, the, the middlemen sometimes are intermediaries of this whole process, um, play an essential role, okay, in making sure that uh, drug pricing is arguably pro-consumer and also in making sure that drugs get distributed. But interestingly enough, if you 
you think about it, you know, they work on a complex secret system of re rebates, both front end and back end rebates that are um, unscrutable and for many reasons also impenetrable, uh, unable to be studied in any kind of systematic way because the numbers are secret. But enough is known to know that PBMs are incentivized to negotiate for bigger rebates for themselves, not for lower list prices. Okay, this is often called in economics literature, the loyalty is to the deal. Okay, and anyone who thinks that a PBM is a proxy for consumer advocate or consumer welfare might want to think again. There might be some dimension of that to the role, but overwhelmingly, the loyalty is to the deal. And that helps you sort of understand perhaps at every point, okay, the loyalty is to the deal here. Um, I think that pharmaceutical drugs have been more in the trying to understand how we got to the prices that we got to and how we got to the distribution and access that we got to more in the American mind lately than ever before. Okay, so a, a couple of very popular books have taken a run at trying to explain this to ordinary people. I'm thinking about uh, the chapters on pharmaceuticals in Elizabeth Rosenthal's New York Times bestseller, An American Sickness right, where she calls pharmacy benefit managers invisible robber barons. I'm not sure uh, that captures all of it, but it is a powerful term. And when you understand how many millions of Americans have read that phrase and been introduced to the invisible force, you can say, oh, well, things are happening, at least in people's minds. Or Catherine Eben's Bottle of Lies, the inside story of the generic drug boom, also a New York Times bestseller, um, a highly unflattering but painstakingly uh, kind of uh, research reporter, even though she's a law professor, style study of the generic drug boom and of AstraZeneca in particular, um, very sobering, okay? Anyone who before that thought, well, the drug companies are just like all firms in a capitalist system are full of complicated motives. We're all complicated. They wanna make money. They wanna do good. Well. I, the book would, in fact, give people pause about the second part of, of that equation, right? And has, in fact, made some people hesitant about AstraZeneca products in general. So powerful has it been. All right. So the pricing of prescription drugs in the United States is overwhelmingly unregulated. This is very important to know. I often speak with people who know little bits about how we attempt to take a run at the pricing of uh, prescription drugs, but I think that the default understanding should be, and it's not that it's deregulated because it never was, okay? It is unregulated. People often ask me why a certain prescription drug, could we pick something like an EpiPen? is so expensive, and of course, the simple answer is because it can be, okay? To a great extent, prescription drug pricing in the United States has, in a nutshell, if it had to be described, someone, you know, stranger entirely to our system who dropped in and wanted the, the down and dirty explanation, it would be uh, what the market will bear, okay? Uh, attempts to pass drug cost regulation have largely failed. Okay, this is despite the fact, and this is a Rand Corp study that was uh, released just this past week, okay, that brand name drugs cost 345% more, or they did in 2012, which was their study parameters, uh, in the United States than they do in comparable countries, in other words, Western developed countries. Interestingly and importantly, generic drugs tend to be cheaper. As some of you know, generic drugs are used much less frequently in some other Western industrialized country than they are in the United States. But that's a pretty staggering fact, okay? One that cries out for an explanation and one that's actually been really hard to figure out. Like, where are the cost levers in this? Because the actual system of production and then sale is so complex. So we can learn a little bit by looking at, so last time Congress considered taking a run at this, what of that prescription drug, sunshine, transparency, accountability and reporting star act from the last Congress? I love it, what is not in there, okay? And that's because it tells me they're not really sure where the levers are that would most impact price. Price increased disclosure provisions, would they help? Well, disclosure, can be very tricky. There is no disclosure law on the federal or the state level that I know of that has complete throughput disclosure. Partial disclosure is much less useful and I, in my opinion, much less likely to have 
any real impact or utility if the goal is to understand prescription drug pricing. Reporting of hospital drug shortages, well, that's interesting, but it's a little bit sort of after the fact, right? Although it's probably gonna help generate conversation and discussion. Tracking numbers and types of free samples of prescription drugs, where's that coming from? The, the concern that prescribers are influenced by the pharmaceutical industry to build a market for something by first starting individuals who have access and uh, affordability problems, starting them with samples, not an unrational, okay, uh, theory, but one that is fairly attenuated in terms of the bigger whole drug spend picture. We're tracking average sale prices for Medicare Part B covered drugs that are infused or injected. Would this help? Well, it is a place of real expense. I will say there is a cost lever there. When we look at the pharmaceutical spend, injectables that are given in a healthcare setting are indeed uh, something of concern, but once again, how, how very partial, right? So at the end of the day, that bill didn't pass, and in its many earlier iterations, it has not passed, okay? So the U.S. government does not directly regulate or negotiate the price of prescription drugs. Um, and this, in fact, is codified in law, okay? In case anybody was getting ideas, Congress has made it clear that the, Med the Medicare should not bargain over the price of prescription drugs and that um, anything provided under the Affordable Care Act should not involve bargaining over the prescription price of, of drugs. So I want to say a little bit about, well, we know these drugs are fantabulously expensive. Um, what does that mean for consumers? Well, the last time someone was able to drill down and I give huge credit to Consumers Union on consumer conduct, what they found out is that when prices go up dramatically, who's gonna be surprised here who's a pharmacist, about a quarter of us do not fill a prescription. Incidentally, about 10% of us never fill prescriptions that are above a certain value because we can't afford it. Um, people, about 12%, unilaterally change their dosage. In other words, they fool around. Um, they might switch to a non-prescription drug option in the hope that that will be sufficient. They may in fact take expired medicine, that's 15%. You can see that people might uh, uh, take a few options. And there is a significant racial and ethnic, okay, disparity in what's called prescription drug coverage and medication use. It's a way of saying that um, brown and black people, okay, disproportionately have to engage in these behaviors. So why do we have trouble taking the first step? I wanna to suggest to you a few things today. So we as a people are mightily conflicted about healthcare and health inequalities in our society and our inability to take the first step. Indeed, in some places, our inability even to shift our weight towards taking the first step towards trying to control prescription drug prices reflects this, right? We have systems where we try to cushion certain parts of the population. Think veterans, where the Veterans Administration is one of the few places in the federal government that is allowed to bargain. It's complicated, but they're allowed to bargain over pharmaceutical prices. It is no surprise they're the low price leader, okay, in terms of prices um, for the federal government, right? Well, we've lost the way to talk about what we might owe each other as fellow citizens or as community members or, or even as human beings. And here, I, I think that part of it is that we don't want to think about uh, the fact that we, we have special groups that we take care of. Um, then we have certain groups that we say, well, you're outside of our kind of uh, corona or area of concern. And that would be essentially the Medicare Part D beneficiaries who sit loose in a marketplace, okay, often confronting pretty high copays and deductibles, even now that the so-called donut hold has, ha hole has been closed. And then we have a third sort of place where we say, well, we have some protections for you, but all of these really just nibble around the edges if you think about it. Primarily, we are conflicted about what role we ought to play in terms of letting the market set the price of pharmaceutical drugs along a free market. I think we've lost our way. The values of the marketplace are rarely probed, tested, and challenged in this area, by which I mean the idea, oh, that the market will take care of everything. It's important to understand that the market, in, from one worldview, will take care of everything. From another view, the price of producing the next unit, okay, of a prescription drug after the first unit is almost nothing. And efficiency theory would say, therefore, after the first prescription drug is produced, Every unit after that should be free. 
right? We say, I think our response to that might be, but what we're doing is we're amortizing the cost of development and research over all those other doses. Are we? It's a very crude tool. We're doing a very bad job, if that's what we think we're doing. So I guess my point is that I don't think that the marketplace of values gives us a clear answer. It points us, in fact, in two different directions. We are not unlike Dorothy when she confronts the scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz, compelled to do some thinking for ourselves. Uh, and in that, I suggest maybe that's the probing, testing, and challenging of this area. Finally, we are conflicted about how much we want to reward inventors for innovation in the marketplace and, and how much that might be at risk if we stepped in and do some, did something. I will point out to you that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the United States Constitution says nothing about having inviolable, extremely lengthy pharmaceutical patents. It simply says that Congress has the authority right, to reward inventors and creators okay, for certain periods of time. Um, so patent protection is an issue. Interestingly, its origins are in the Constitution, but its parameters are our creation. Uh, there's no denying that. So what would a genuine first step look like? You're probably like, oh, well, you know, all this is pretty sobering, right? What would it look like? Well, I want to suggest a few things. I think we could unleash Medicare's prescription drug bargaining power, right, by uh, actually, first of all, if necessary, changing the law, right, saying, let Medicare bargain. Medicare is what would be known in the industry as a power buyer, because they would, in fact, be buying so many pharmaceuticals. Uh, if the system were reorganized in this way. And they might in fact make a dent, make a dent for everyone. One of the powerful things about Medicare is most people don't realize this in the American healthcare system, and I am not speaking just about pharmaceutical drugs. Most other systems, meaning commercial insurance, all other forms of government sponsored insurance, price off of Medicare. So even if you're not enrolled in Medicare, looking at it from this perspective, you are greatly influenced by Medicare. Indeed, the way I explain it to my students is we're all in Medicare now. Okay, if all even hospital pricing is Medicare plus a certain percentage. The next thing I would suggest is pivoting to government operated programs for production of some essential prescription drugs, such as insulin. This was not something I thought about until the past few years watching Civic RX ramp up, first in New York and now in other states, tempting to say there are some drugs that are so important for the general welfare. Okay, for such a significant part of the population that if it cannot be brought to market by commercial entities for an accessible price, then the government should be in the business of producing them. This is something like the Defense Production Act, which has been now invoked, right, to prioritize the production of PPE and main ultimately for the production of vaccines. We need to develop a body of case law derivative from consumer protection law that defines unconscionable pricing in the prescription drug marketplace, okay? Um, Michelle Mello has written some really wonderful things on this. We need to combine the buyer power of all government purchases of prescription drugs at both the federal and the state level, right? Why does this matter? I am business oriented in my outlook and knowledgeable about how the purchases go and volume drives so much. Okay, even small states should not approach the pharmaceutical industry alone. All right, they simply do not have the power. And the patent system reform is badly needed, targeted at abuse of pharmaceutical patents and the patent system in general. And I am talking about patent hopping. I am talking about evergreening patents. And I am talking about the tweaking of molecules as well as the tweaking of delivery systems that makes it so prescription drugs in our country are so high. You're like, but where will we find the political will, right? Where will we, you know? Well, I think sometimes Americans want a hack, right? Give me, give me a hack, give me a life hack, let's fix it. Gnarly, complex problems often have complex solutions. I sit comfortably with that, although perhaps not happily. So the easy idea, and this would have been what, in this past summer and into the fall even, from the Trump administration was, well, let's have drug importation from Canada. Now, most Americans, whatever their political beliefs, in the high 80s percentage last time I saw a poll, support drug importation from Canada. The problem with that, just in case you've forgotten this, is you know how many Americans are there? Roughly 330 million. How many Canadians are there? Ooh, roughly 38 million. So they're in the ballpark of being about the size of California. Where will these drugs come from? It isn't about the importation of drugs from Canada. It's about the importation of Canadian style price controls, 
right? They have uh, something called the PMPRB, uh, which is essentially uh, a board that sits to talk about price and has the authority, in fact, indeed, to send manufacturers back to the drawing board to come with a better price. Now, it's a way to have regulation, Canadian style regulation, without acknowledging it. This is the interesting thing about Americans. Sometimes when we want to make change that we're conflicted about, we kind of want to hide it. All right, the best analogy in the hospital world is so disproportionate share payments, those of you who know what they are, have been reconfigured and re reduced um, some states, and there still are uh, two handfuls of states that have not yet expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act are aghast. They want that money. Wait a minute, that's federal money that you spurn by not expanding Medicaid. Well, but that's money that comes in the back door of the hospital, not that comes in the front door. So we are conflicted, right? So what do we do? I, you know, I, these troubled times, um, probably like some of you have gone back and looked at lots of things that I'm interested in that I've read that talk about, are we really a country or are we really several countries? And has it always been that way? I hope I don't shock anyone by, by talking about that. Um, because if not, then how do we come together? So I, I give you some language uh, from John Marshall Harlan in Jacobson v. Massachusetts, where he said, you know, there are times where the government has this, the authority to have the safety of the general public foremost in its mind, okay? And the interesting thing about that is we will see this case interpreted again and again, who knows where it will go, okay, as vaccination progresses or if vaccination hesitancy becomes a big enough concern with relation to inability to form herd immunity in some locations. But I do think it also says, so we are in this together in certain situations, right? So could the COVID-19 pandemic be a teachable moment, right? And the interesting thing about it, any of you who know about um, infectious diseases, weren't we all always in the hands of each other, right? What about hepatitis C? What about that huge outbreak? of hepatitis C in Santa Monica a couple of years ago, all circled around one tourist location, right? Which no one wanted to suggest <laughs> might actually be because we all gather together. We all live, if we live life in the public square and each of us has the health of each other in our hands. I think this is more apparent to more Americans these days, but I think it was always so. So why do we frame this debate about individual rights versus the good of the community? And I think the struggle for freedom isn't bilateral, but trilateral. And I've been back reading Colin Woodward's book, The American Character, and I hope you will as well. The tension is the state, the people, and, and would-be oligarchs or aristocrats. And if you don't think that this trilateral tension isn't in play with what is going on with GameStop and meme stocks, you might want to think again. All right, so have we lost our capacity to be shocked? I think to some point we may have become inured, okay, to the great devastation that we wreak in people's lives by essentially, and let's use the word, rationing access to pharmaceutical by um, protected group, favored class, and unfavored class. Um, and, I, and I do think that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Um, I wanted to end on a more positive note, and so I throw it out here that just, just in the past week, um, I've been looking at proposed regulations and executive orders that are coming out of the new administration, and lo and behold, here's a quote uh, that I came across that said, you know, we need to look at things besides the cost benefit and the free market analysis. Those are important and, and can speak very powerfully to uh, regulations, but we should also think about public health and safety social welfare, economic growth, racial justice, environmental stewardship, human dignity, equity, and the interests of future generations. And I'm like, yeah. And uh, whether or not this will turn into something that actually, you know, is concrete, I do not know, but I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on it as well. Thank you. So my, my understanding now is that I uh, Thank you all, and I invite uh, Professor Stephen Laborg to make comments. And let me end my slideshow. Great, thank you so much, Professor Marcarial. That was an excellent talk, and it, it highlighted so many important and, and varied areas that I, I was so exciting trying to write down notes and, and have comments to add to, to each and everything. And so, 
Uh, I'm excited by this webinar and, and thank you for, for your comments today. Mine, I don't obviously have a, a slideshow as I'm kind of reacting and commenting and giving my perspective, but for the audience, um, I am Stephen Laboric. I'm an assistant director at The Ohio State University, and I work primarily at the Wexner Medical Center, and I also teach at the College of Pharmacy about the pharmaceutical supply chain and much of the complexities that you were able to highlight there to graduate students. Um, and, and you were right on on so many areas. I, I think I really enjoyed that you began talking about your disclosures, you know, and, I, and it made me think about myself and I'm and, and, and happy to say um, I have no, nothing to disclose, but when you were talking about, you know, transparency and incomplete transparency and referring to the Sunshine Act, I think people view the Sunshine Act as, as this silver bullet of really getting to see all what's out there. But it, by and large, mostly applies to physicians or, or providers only. Um, and I think sometimes the general public may be surprised to know that pharmacists very often can receive compensation directly from the pharmaceutical industry. And many, many other healthcare providers, I'm sure there's attorneys and others, you know, many, many professions um, are essentially on the unofficial payroll of big pharma. And um, it really is important to understand the disclosures of individuals that you're talking to about this because um, it really may impact their worldview and maybe the, the level of truth that they're able or willing to share in your discussion. So I, I do have nothing to disclose, although sometimes I wish that I did. I probably would be much more wealthy than I am now. So uh, take that or leave it, I guess, is, is what that's for. But I really enjoyed your, your comment about, you know, is there a moral dimension to pricing and in your definition of morality is, you know, basically, is it acceptable conduct? And it made me think, you know, acceptable to whom I think is, is a great question that first came to my mind. And I think each of us probably have varying personal definitions of, of what we might deem to be acceptable. I think there's probably a large consensus, you know, I don't, I don't have numbers or statistics to support, but just in the general feeling I get, a lot of people are generally unhappy with, with pharmaceutical pricing. And so it feels generally unacceptable. Um, and then according to the definition, therefore maybe immoral, right? But despite that, it, it is still happening, you know, when it's not trending in the right direction, the pharmaceuticals really aren't getting any cheaper. They're not getting more regulated. Um, and, and so that's kind of an interesting question is to understand, well, well why is that? Um, and I liked how you presented the, the complex web of pharmaceutical manufacturers and wholesale distributors and PBMs, and also important to, to play in, you know, the, the payers that may own or contract with the PBMs as well as not only looking at pharmacies and hospitals, but also the group purchasing organizations to which they belong and the piece of the pie that they get out of it. It really is an incredibly complex and truly amazing web um, of intermingled financials. And, and to your point of it being you know, really impossible to research or understand because all of these agreements are confidential, proprietary, and trade secret. And so, you know, as someone who works in a medical center and was responsible for, for contracting and buying over $600 million worth of pharmaceuticals on an annual basis, I know these webs very, very well. Um, you know, and, and what I sometimes feel internally conflicted about is, you know, what, what are the implications to society about what's happening and, and what is my job? You know, what am I obligated to do in my role? And, you know, I'm obligated to maximize the financial performance of our organization, which anyone who's employed by any organization generally, you know, is, is implored to do just that. And so in some ways, I feel that each player you know, when, you, when you look at the system, is a rational actor responding to the system in the way that it's structured, right? Because you mentioned pharmaceutical pricing isn't deregulated, it's unregulated. 
there are no regulations. And so things are happening out there. And, you know, as a pharmacy and a healthcare provider and a hospital, you either have to play the game or you're going to lose tons of money. And so it's, I think sometimes pharma likes to paint the picture out there that the pharmacy is evil or the hospital is evil and let's shift the blame to them because look at the prices they're charging you, right? And, and those, that in and by itself is not a false statement. There are incredibly ridiculously high prices being charged, but I think you have to look at why. And it's not because the hospital's making tons of money off of you. In many cases, the hospital is break even or in sometimes losing money even with these ridiculously high prices. You know, we're merely just passing them on because we have to pay them in order to gain access to these products to treat the patients. And so that is a really interesting perspective that, that I see in my daily work that I think is, is maybe somewhat underappreciated more so in, in the public sector. Um, and, you know, when you talk about Medicare and their inability to bargain, you know, many people are, are shocked. And how could this be? Why would this be? Why is this the law? It's actually illegal for them to, to negotiate, right? Well, you have to look at the pharmaceutical lobby and their lobbying power and just the sheer amount of money that's spent. So we started by saying, you know, pharma is already paying many players in the game is you know, including providers and, and other stakeholders in the process, but they're also paying Congress, right? You know, they're, they're funding election campaigns and, and various other um, you know, avenues to, to have influence. I think in 2019 alone, the pharmaceutical lobbying group spent over almost $300 million in just that year. That's more than twice than the second highest lobbying group. And it's more than almost like thousands of lobbying groups combined in just one group. So they are the largest lobbying group in the country, the most powerful, and therefore the most effective at influencing the laws and or lack of laws around, around drug pricing regulation in this country. And so we've kind of gotten ourselves into a catch-22, right? Because the system we've created allows this very, very wealthy entity to exert its wealth to prevent change. And the wealth is already there and they have such power to really shut down anyone who tries to, to come out against it. And so it is kind of a reality of the situation, but they are powerful and, and we do see that year over year. And you know, when we talked about the amount of money that, that the drugs cost and that's truly really what the market can bear, the market is, is bearing it. There's, there's some sad consequences to it, but you know, it, it keeps growing and people keep changing. But when you look at what they also spend money on is, um, you know, marketing, right? The United States is one of only two countries on the planet that allow direct to consumer marketing. You know, if you talk to anyone in Europe or, or Africa or Asia and they come to the United States, they laugh when they see commercials on primetime television for pharmaceuticals, right? Like Opdivo, you know, like, I can't just go to the store and buy Opdivo. Why do I need this commercial about it, right? Because there's influence in making you think that you need it and getting your doctor to prescribe it for you. And patient satisfaction scores now can impact your reimbursement. And so if my prescriber dissatisfies me, he can get paid less money. And so prescribers generally want to make their patients happy and patients are made happy by getting what they think they want, even though they're potentially being manipulated by the media, which is that same big wealthy monster that's out there manipulating the provider and the Congress and everyone else. Um, and so it, it's a really, really interesting and complex web that, that I love talking about it. And um, I know I've been, probably been saying too much here, and I know we have another panelist who's going to be joining us from the, the Fisher College of Business. I believe it is um, Professor Gray, is that right? Yes. 
it my turn. That is correct. And I'm sorry to the to the organizers. We did a sound check and I switched to headphones because now there's a little bit of noise in the background. So can you hear me okay? Just quick, okay. Um, so thanks, Stephen, and thanks, Anne Marie, for the for the presentation. I'll take a little bit of a, a devil's advocate perspective in a minute after um, talking about a couple of things that came up in the talk that I wanted to mentioned. So I, I do uh, research in the pharmaceutical industry, mostly on quality and shortage risk. And actually, I'm a contracted employee of the FDA on contract, helping them try to predict quality risk and predict shortage risk in both generic and original drugs. And so very familiar with Catherine Evans' bottle of lies, um, and actually been on a panel with her discussing uh, drug quality. I just want to clarify, it was actually a generic firm. Rambaxi was the focus of the yeah. of the, of the book, um, not, uh, not AstraZeneca. There was the person who went to Rambaxi and exposed the problems came from AstraZeneca in North Carolina. So it was a generics firm, not an original drug firm, that was the, the villain, I guess, in the book uh, for poor quality practices at their manufacturing plant, which will lead into something I'll talk about in a second. Um, but working with the FDA, they recognize a lot of these challenges, obviously, and the people I'm working with are focused on quality and shortages, and they recognize the, the pressures put on the drug manufacturers by the contractors, uh, the, the, the wholesalers and the PBMs for price, particularly the generics contract manufacturers, and how those potentially create incentives in manufacturing to, to maybe even cut corners and, and, and at least operate at the lowest possible cost. Uh, so I'll get to that in a second. So a few points I want to make. One is it was really interesting at the, to see your last slide uh, quoting Biden's new regulation. Um, on, on expanding uh, the cost-benefit analysis. And, and uh, there was an article by Mick Mulvaney and Joe Grogan in the Wall Street Journal, an editorial, arguing that that was an invitation for hyper-regulation, for regulators to overreach uh, kind of their, their bounds. And, and when I received Anne Marie's slides yesterday or the day before, I was actually in the process of writing a response to Mick Mulvaney and Joe Grogan's, editor Grogan's editorial arguing uh, research I've done and actually in procurement and manufacturing um, shows that, that uh, that in incentivizing people on measurables actually leads to suboptimal decisions and, and um, you need to, to free people up. Now, do we trust regulators enough? Do we as a society trust regulators enough to uh, value uh, what we say we value and, and, and how do they, how's that act operate in practice? I think there's legitimate concern there, but it was really interesting to see that you pointed that out and I fully support uh, at least the intent of that regulation and hopefully the realization of it. But back to the pharmaceutical. So I think it's, um, you know, I think I'm, I'm from the business school and um, I, it's, I feel I need to take this, this position. You know, so if I, let's take the position of a pharmaceutical um, original drug manufacturer. Um, so they would argue um, that the drugs don't create themselves, uh, right? So we, there, there is a choice between expensive drugs and no drugs, and it may be a false choice, but there are some, there is a fair amount of research on expected future value of the drugs, revenue of the drugs relates directly to the amount of investment that goes into developing the drug. So if the laws were to suddenly change in the US, it, there's also been arguments that the United States uh, pays for the world's drug development and the rest of the world is free riding uh, because US consumers are the ones who are bearing the cost of the innovation uh, because we're the only country that still does not regulate drug prices. But if we were to suddenly go to Canada and Europe prices uh, would that mean that drugs are less drugs are developed? And, and I believe the answer to that is yes. There would be less innovation, less new drugs developed. Now, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think on, on first you think it's a bad thing because you won't have drugs to to deal with diseases. But there's some arguments that we may have some drugs that are being overprescribed, and, and maybe having a few less of them wouldn't be terrible. But I think there is that there is definitely that um, angle which I think is true. So I think if it's not as simple as saying we lower prices and we still get the same level of innovation and we still get the same pipeline of drugs coming through, there is a cost to that as well. Now the system as the, as the other two on the panel have articulated well is, is messy and, and uh, certainly could use some improvement. Um, I agree strongly with things like the direct to consumer advertising uh, being kind of silly and um, a lot of the middlemen and, and PBMs uh, being a problem. The other point I do wanna make though is that um, and I've got some research on this around the, 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 um, yeah, the, the, the Generic, the, the patent expiration leading to the generic drugs, leading to intense cost competition, um, uh, does have some potential adverse side effects too, in particular in places where regulations aren't quite as strong, uh, like India, um, with uh, challenges in quality and, and, and off quality drugs being shipped, um, off quality drugs being made and shipped. And so the original drug manufacturers, you know, large, they, their, their profit margins on their drugs, as you pointed out, Anne Marie, when they're, when they're still original and they're still patented are, are massive. So there is, 
definitely an incentive to keep the supply going and keep the supply of high quality. But there, there does seem to be anecdotally, and I've got some ongoing research, which is still in the, in the revision review process, um, looking at uh, differences between generics and original drugs. And, and there is some, some more risk to the consumer from a quality standpoint of generics. And so continuing to push the price of drugs down um, can, could create a, a scenario where potentially um, there, there's some quality challenges as well. Um, and so I am almost done rambling here. I did want to just so I mean so the, 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 again you two have mentioned a lot of um, good points. You know what what are some creative things we can do here? So we have Biden's regulation allowing uh, allowing um, you know regulators to be more free and creative. Is there something we can come up with? Um, there's been discussion about a regulatory board pricing drugs based on um, QALY uh, quality. Uh, I forget what it stands for. Quantity of uh, quality of life years. It's basically quality of life years uh, that the drug. Uh, supports. Now, of course, that also has been, that's been shown to be very expensive in a lot of cases. So it's still be a large, a large price. Um, obviously, we already do have a lot of ways for people who are you know, below the Medi Medicaid line and shipped it to get some drugs uh, for free or, or cheap. And there's, there's systems that, that uh, distinguish pricing based on ability to pay. Um, that also is a complex system. Um, so I don't really have an, an answer. Um, but I do also want to point out the, the discussion of you know, if we give the regulators more and more and more power, um, we also increase the incentive to um, lobby <laughs> and and get, you know more more of that kind of the uh, regulators aren't this perfect um, entity that that is all seeing and all knowing and can set the, set the uh, regulations accurately and, and and meet the the absolute social welfare benefit and so you still get the gaming going on in in there so. Um, I don't know if those points came across clearly, but I, I jumped around a little bit in my notes, but I'll stop there and let uh, either Q&A from the audience or my panelists chime in. Yes, yeah, so thanks, John. Um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to remind our audience members that you can submit a question um, by plugging it into that Q&A. Uh, hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, the little Zoom toolbar. Type in your question if you have something that you want the panelists to address. Got a few come through. Um, I have a couple of questions, however, that I want to ask um, the people on the panel. Uh, so as someone who, who primarily, whose primary background is in philosophy, uh, one of the things we always like do is play devil's advocate. So I want to bring up one kind of devil's advocate style question. There is a well-known view in business ethics, um, often attributed to Milton Friedman, called the Friedman Doctrine, which is that the only thing that you are obligated to do as someone working in business is to maximize the profits um, of your company or your industry uh, while also obeying the law um, and, and some of the relevant social customs. So um, I'm curious if uh, you will just think, the idea is that your, your main obligation is to the shareholders in that company as an employee of the company. And I'm curious if you all think that, that that whole idea is just totally bogus, and if so, why? Or if you think that it might be a decent general principle in business, but that the pharmaceutical industry is an exception because of its connection to people's personal health and the way that um, the way drug pricing is done, the way that it can Im potentially impact consumers. Can I chime in first on that one? I actually assigned that article to my class when we discuss um, ethics and procurement and sourcing, which is a at the class I teach is procurement sourcing, not ethics. And we talk about uh, issues that you get into global sourcing. Um, I think that um, his arguments um, make sense if you have a functioning public sector that's able to create laws and regulations that um, meet the intent of, you know, that, that, that serve society and therefore the business person focuses on what they his, the, the, it's, it's the best part of his argument in my mind is, do we want the CEO of a company deciding how to spend profits, which are either their employees, um, the consumers, or the shareholders, or do we want them maximizing those, paying their fair share of taxes, and then letting the government, the elected officials, decide how to allocate that money? And so the, the argument is tremendously logical and, and um, I think appropriate, but it depends on um, the money that the taxes that are being paid to the government um, being able to write the proper laws. And it depends on, you know, he doesn't say just within the laws, he says the laws and norms. So I think he clarifies that it's not that you're doing something you know is probably ethically wrong, but it's, it's, it's right on the edge of the law. And so I think as long as you have those caveats, it's a, it's a 
reasonable thing to talk about. No, it's not a popular view right now. <laughs> so I'm sure I'm going to get uh, pushback, but I think it has, I think it's pretty logical if, if the laws and, and, and regulations um, are appropriate and, and the business person doesn't feel like they have to step in because it's just not, the, the government's not taking their tax dollars and doing what they should be with it. If I may, I'll say, I think that all of that, uh, Professor Gray, is an interesting observation. I'll say that not only do you need to have a functioning public sector, but you also need to have a functioning market. Okay, and um, uh, because in many ways, what Professor Friedman was articulating is in fact the law. Okay, just in case anybody never got the memo, okay, for a commercial enterprise, the legal duty is to provide maximum return to the shareholders. And you're right, consistent with the framework of what is uh, legally permissible, all right? You might understand that some people might say, I'm all in, but I can't do any of these things because I'm in that box, okay? The problem with that is it's hard for people to buy into that theory. So let's just if the regulatory infrastructure isn't working well, or if the market is highly imperfect. And I would argue that the market for pharmaceuticals has been so distorted, okay, <laughs> by gaming that, well, it would take an irredeemable optimist, and maybe you are, okay, to think that we could somehow return it to a functioning market. Um, lots of attempts have been made, I guess, was part of my point in the talk. Yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, there's the, the very real challenge of, I, I agree with, with those principles, and, you know, the legal view is exactly right. You know, that is their duty to do it. And that's why they're doing what they're doing. But at the same time, it does kind of beg the question and, and kind of makes you reflect, well, what, a, what about all of those people who are, are harmed by the system? And, and do we have the right social framework and supports, you know, to, to help those groups in other ways? You know, one thing that's interesting, right, is the if we truly believed in this country that the pharmaceuticals were a, a public good and not necessarily something for private business, then maybe the government should manufacture pharmaceuticals, right? But that, that's something they could choose to do, but they've chosen not to do it because that's not, I guess, our values or the will um, to, to do that. And you might definitely probably argue that well, private industry has the knowledge and the expertise to do it better. And I, you're probably right there as well. And, and, and so it's a, every, I think every viewpoint is accurate and valid and it adds to the challenge of, we all can identify these issues, but I've, I've really struggled to find what is the solution. And I don't know, and maybe we're too far gone to, to think that there could be one. So I like that Stephen brought up the question of like, what is the solution? Because that's kind of another thing I wanted to, to ask you all about. And mainly, um, it's kind of the specific role of like, what, what ought the government to do? What's the overall role? And how does the government move forward, given all this? Um, uh, in, in, um, and in your main presentation, you brought up like, kind of political polarization and the division that exists in our current and it's, it's quite, uh, quite disparate, I feel uh, under current circumstances. And so I kind of have two related questions here. Um, one would be like, what, what steps could we make towards solving some of these problems given this background of just deep, deeply held disagreement uh, about what the proper healthcare policy should look like, um, not just among politicians, but among the voters themselves. And also um, kind of a more general question, does the government have some kind of obligation um, to intervene in this situation, given um, these these you know significant price increases that we've been seeing in the way that it could potentially affect um, ordinary citizens and their healthcare. Are you asking me? Um, I mean, I'm pitching these to the panel as a whole, but anybody's welcome to to jump in. I recognize that like some of these like that's a big picture question that may not be answerable in a webinar format Friday afternoon, but hey, you know. We're taking a crack at it. Maybe it can only be answered in a webinar format on a Friday afternoon. I'll take the second. Does the government have some role to play? So we are at a moment where we could argue sort of uh, political philosophy seesaw. Okay, as I saw it described by someone in the New York Times. Okay, our our ambivalence over the role of government is writ large in this particular issue. But it, it it's brought up in environmentalism. This is not unique to this area. Okay. 
um, I can say that in the face of a completely unregulated market and the potential of mass deprivation, okay, this is probably a pretty good argument for some action by the government. It's no accident that it's under the last administration that proposals were made to do things like, now I'm being facetious, but are you ready? Import all the drugs from Canada so they would have none and bring them down here, okay, and give them to some portion of Americans at a greatly reduced price. You do understand Canada would be very angry in that scenario, just, just so you know, okay? They, they don't think this talk about drug importation is either funny or astute, okay? Because they understand that that giant sucking sound would be every pharmaceutical they need going to the United States. Okay, but I think that uh, so if we have, can concede that the government, you know, what's that old saying? Never believe somebody who shows up and I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But the government actually might be some help. Okay, I think it's significant that as soon as it became apparent that part of the way we were going to achieve herd immunity from COVID-19 was going to have to involve a vaccination program as well as achieving it through exposure. Right, that immediately it had to be announced. Oh, and none of you are going to have to have any out-of-pocket costs for this because people are terrified of the pharmaceutical industry. And I want to suggest to you that had that not been announced, we would have seen violence in the streets. Okay. So the acknowledgement that the government has some role to play, I think it's just on the cusp of being acknowledged, the pure terror that was in people's eyes when they realized, oh, there's going to be a vaccine or multiple vaccines. Oh. I don't have the last time I looked at the list price, $35,000, okay, for the course of the vaccine. That was pure terror. And that was uh, bipartisan pure terror. So that's my answer to the part, the second part of that. Yeah, I'll just say that I think that the government should get involved when there's a market failure and people define market failures differently. Um, and I think, but I think this is a market that probably that I think can't operate on its own, right? I mean, I mean, patents are a government construct. So that um, if the market were truly entirely free um, and, and there were no patents, then that also would, that would probably reduce prices, but also reduce potential incentive for innovation. But then the, the, then the trick is, and I don't have the answer, and I have a couple of silly, I think that there's easy things that can move the ball a little bit, like the direct to consumer advertising and some other things, but this is a, a complicated mess. But I, I mean, so the second question is, I think there clearly is a, this is a market that cannot operate independently, just given um, given the structure, given the state of the market. And so their gov therefore government does have the right to be involved and a need to be involved. Um, and then how to tweak it, I'll, I'll turn that over to Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I secretly have the answer. Just been waiting for this moment. Uh, but no, I think the, the reality is, um, I think many people acknowledge and agree that something is off. And, and I think they agree that they want to see something done, but everyone disagrees about what that something is. And, you know, I think for, well, I guess, you know, we're all conflicted with our internal and personal bias, right? So in my job, I represent a hospital and a health system. So likely my proposals would probably make you know, be beneficial towards that group and or me and make my job easier, right? And so it's hard to be unbiased because you know, whether you work in the industry, play a role in this, or you're just a patient at the end of the day, everyone is impacted in some way. And we all have to kind of acknowledge our bias. And, and to that end, you know, the government regulated proposal, they would have their own bias there too. And so I think I'm a proponent for change, but I don't necessarily have a, a silver bullet. And it's, I'll just say, I mean, the market failure argument, I mean, the cleanest ones are like environmental issues. So left to their own devices, the firms would externalize the environmental implications. And even that's not necessarily easy, what the right level is. And I think it's on the government to not only try to fix the problem, but also make sure in the process of doing that, they're not creating new, new problems. And that's the whole innovation risk, which I think I feel a little bit more of a concern than, than, than some people. But um, so it's, it's that incredibly difficult balance. And the reason we're talking about this and this has been such an issue for so long is because of how hard it is. Okay, so I have I have one more thing I wanna to pitch to you all and then I think we'll turn it over to uh, working through the Q&A um, that, we've, that we've got. Um, but I, I wanted to ask about something that uh, Stephen brought up in his, in his commentary. So I'm curious about how that, how this fits into it, which is the direct consumer marketing. Um, it's something that I teach about in my pharmacoethics course and something that has, I've myself always found kind of weird. 
And when I learned that only US and New Zealand uh, allow it, I was like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. It, I feel like it's weird because it is um, <laughs> in the in that international context. Um, so I, I guess I just have two questions. One is what, what role uh, does direct consumer marketing play in these price increases and the related question, like, should it be illegal or much more stringently regulated? Uh, I think, you know, a good point is there are regulations, uh, you know, the FDA regulates what can and cannot be said in, in a pharmaceutical advertisement. And you may have seen, you can Google this, you know, like when the FDA can force pharmaceutical companies to correct, and I think there was one for a, a birth control, you know, where the ad begins, you may have seen our, us previously tell you that this, and actually what we meant to say was that, and that's a result of the, the government, you know, receiving a complaint and reacting to it. And, and just because the regulation is there, doesn't mean that the government approves of every ad. So basically the, gov the regulation exists, and it's the responsibility of the pharmaceutical companies to pay attention to what they can and cannot say. And it's up to people uh, like the community, physicians, pharmacists, whoever, to listen to these ads and say, oh, you actually cannot say that and report them to the FDA. And if it gets reported and if it gets investigated, then and only then will there be a forced correction? But there are many, many claims and advertising things out there that technically are illegal, but nobody's ever followed through the process to, to hold them accountable to that. And I think that's dangerous you know, to the community because people are being told messages that they believe are true because, well, it was on TV or I, I read it online or it was on the label even in some cases. And it doesn't mean that it was legal or permitted or supported. This is a good observation. The FDA's power and authority to police, as it were, commercial uh, speech, and, and that covers advertising for all different kinds of things, has always been woefully <laughs> underutilized. And uh, you, you have it exactly right. And there's nothing proactive at all about it. And it very, very, very occasionally reactive. Um, I guess I see the problem with direct-to-consumer advertising really is a part that needs to be joined up with what I'm going to call the direct-to-prescriber advertising, <laughs> okay? Because I'm not going to pretend that much of that detailing that's done is really the conveyance of medical information, okay? It's the conveyance of lunch, a free lunch, which is to create uh, a relationship. Any of you who knows about gift exchange relationships, a sense of obligation, it works. Okay, and there's a lot of good data on that. Okay, uh, you know, people attempting to convey, you know, scientific information is another thing. Okay, but that's not what's going on in, in you know, a, a golfing jaunt to Hawaii. Mm, I'm not buying it. Okay, where you spend an hour in the morning in a room where someone tells you things that, you know, are very, very basic about something. So I see it as both. I see that we, we stuff a lot of information nominally into the system, both into consumers. Why do people feel a need to individually educate themselves about all pharmaceuticals? Why are we all amateur pharmacists? Because we don't trust the ones we have and we don't trust the prescribers. And now I'll really say the heretical thing and with good reason. Uh, and that's why everybody, if you've noticed it as an amateur doctor, an amateur pharmacist uh, in the United States, it's so busy being all these other professions, you know, it's exhausting, but it also tells you something about the level of trust. Yeah, I think it just gets in the way of the doctor being able to kind of talk to the patient about what they think is best for them because the patient has preconceived notions. So I think it should just be, the D2C at least advertising should be illegal. And then the free sample thing is a little trickier to manage uh, and make illegal, but I think making that, and my, my real doctor friends have said that that stuff has gone down quite a bit through the years. Um, so there's a lot less of it going on. So there's been some restrictions, I think, put in place, but there probably could be more. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into some of the audience questions. Um, we've got two people who are asking kind of about uh, some of the stuff we were actually just touching on, which is kind of the, the PBMs and their role in getting kickbacks. Um, so you've got one person who asks, uh, could the existence and influence of PBMs and the financial incentives they get for contracting with certain pharmacies play a role in the price increases 
they also observe that uh, they, they feel like the more people and corporations that get involved, the higher the prices go. And someone else asked, um, just says, uh, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on whether the perceived benefits of um, these kickbacks uh, to PBMs are worth the, um, or the benefits in the supply chain exceed the risk associated with these people profiting. Somebody's got a slide. Yeah, I just shared my screen and I think this image is, is really beneficial for, for people to understand. It helps kind of uh, understand the vertical alignment that's happening right now in healthcare. So along the top are the major insurance providers or private insurance providers in our country. Many people on this panel probably can point at one of these and say, yep, that's who my health insurance is through. Um, and then these insurers directly contract with a PBM. And in some cases, they actually own the PBM. So Aetna owns CVS Caremark. And then in this PBM contracts, or in some cases, directly owns the specialty pharmacy where you have to get the drug. And then sometimes also contracts with and or owns where your provider, you know, who's providing the care. And so with this vertical integration and owning every single step in the process, you can see how they're able to garner additional money at every step of the process. You know, when these were all different entities, you could see there's various, you know, everyone taking their cut along the way. But in you know, the example of Aetna CVS is a great one, that huge merger that was approved, um, created this mega entity that can, you know, diagnose you, treat you, bill you, and insure you and make money off you every step along the way. There's really not much incentive to save you any money because their incentive along the way is how can they get more money out of you to make more as a as a private publicly held company i think the the etna cvs response would be these extreme and we call this vertical integration okay i'm also an antitrust professor right was an antitrust litigator it's extreme and i will use that word vertical integration will necessarily benefit okay, uh, the patients, because there will be so many efficiencies, okay, in terms of, it was inefficient. <laughs> uh, footnote, it was probably inefficient to compete, but, uh, you know, it was inefficient to have so many interlocking pieces, okay, and now that we're so, you know, all of all this will redound to great savings, right, higher quality, because of, you know, information will travel so much more smoothly, and ultimately consumers will benefit. I am of the opinion that that is completely wrong. I think that the approval of this uh, merger, even with various conditions, was a tremendous mistake. And as with so many mega mergers, we can only express our regret in the rearview mirror because, as one judge famously said, it's very difficult to unscramble the eggs. Okay, but I, I think that this is deeply troubling. Okay, you could put up another slide, and maybe you have one. You, you seem to have an amazing uh, PowerPoint deck that also shows a similar set of, of mergers happening in hospitals. Okay, integrated with clinics, integrated with doctors groups, the sort of big medicine, if I may put this, medic, you know, the corporatization, okay, the extreme vertical integration across healthcare is of concern to a significant number of people, but you sort of have to be inside baseball to know that this is happening, right? And that's a travesty. All right, so another question from the audience. Uh, this was one of the first ones that we had posed was about, um, let's see, question is essentially, how do you see um, the subsidizing pro um, subsidization of uh, certain programs for drugs and other free programs fitting into an overall, like an overall kind of pharmaceutical industries, um, an idealized right operation like what role would it play if we if we're in thinking about the solution to this overall problem i can i can give some perspective to that many of these types of programs exist and you've probably seen them on tv you know if you can't afford your drugs contact xyz right um, and in some ways, I think many of these programs are self-serving because they benefit the drug companies in a number of ways. And it's not to say that 
they don't end up helping patients at the end of the day because they do. However, I think that the benefit by and large is still to themselves ultimately at the end of the day. And maybe they're very smart and strategic for, for doing so. But you know, when you have these programs that allow the drug to be quote affordable to all, it makes it much more likely that prescribers are going to prescribe the drugs to their patients. And they don't then have to understand or worry about, can my patient afford it or not? Because I just saw on TV, if they can't, they just reach out and then it's the problem solved. Um, and so I think it helps with adoption of high cost prescription drugs and, and you know, it encourages providers to, to do more of it. And then when the pharmaceutical company itself is providing these free drug services, those are great tax write-offs, right? They can say, oh, well, this drug was a million dollars for this course of therapy and we gave it away. So we're gonna write it off, even though we know it probably only costs maybe $10 to actually manufacture. It's now a million dollar write-off. It's not like a colleges with tuition and, and then scholarships. So you, you can charge high tuitions, uh, collect those from people who are able to pay them, and then yeah, try to be able to serve people who aren't able to pay for scholarships and, and the like. So I think it's it's a way to keep, to take the company's perspective, it's a way to keep the profits from the drug they developed while still feeling as though they're not, um, and, and I don't know how this works in practice. I don't know how many people who ask for the money actually get it, how many people who need the money actually get it, but make them still feel like they're serving those who can't afford the expensive drug that they developed or the expensive to develop drug that they developed. I'll just say that it's PR genius and it's also lipstick on a pig. Yes, yeah, so that sounds like every, all, everybody's in agreement that uh, might play some role that in present circumstances, not, not, not quite doing what it's advertised to do, being a little more self-serving to the interests of the uh, people who are offering those programs. Um, so one question that came up in the chat was about uh, EpiPen specifically, which I know was mentioned, uh, which is basically just kind of, um, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's essentially like, why are these, wh why do these people still need to market and, and how can they be using marketing as a justification for their dramatic price increases? Uh, they point out that um, this is not a drug you can skip because it actually stops you from dying. Uh, so, um, my cynical answer would just be like, well, marketing is effective and probably makes people more likely to buy the product. Um, and that that's probably the main reason they still market, but maybe there's more to it than that. I think that's the great response, but the, the detail that's specific is that, you know, when a drug becomes off patent, there's generics available, right? And so you can go to maybe Walgreens and buy epinephrine, but nobody really wants to buy that. They want to buy EpiPen because I saw it on TV. It has this great name with this ring to it. The packaging looks cool and I trust this brand. So I'm going to pay more for it. You know, that, that at the end of the day is advertising. I think something like 90% of the drugs prescribed in the U.S. now are generic. Um, and so the, the, the brand owners, the instant their exclusivity is gone, um, they typically don't drop their price. They lose a ton of share. Um, but it, and EpiPen did get us a competitor, I believe. So they, they, they had that big uh, controversy about the big price. And then very shortly thereafter, if I'm not mistaken, a competitor came into the market. Um, I'm not sure if it's a generic competitor or someone who had gotten a different NDA or a slightly different uh, version of it. But um, yeah, trying to I, I just agreeing with Stephen that usually the volume drops dramatically when the exclusivity is lost and trying to protect as much of that as they can. So one of the other questions that came up here, um, someone wants to wonder if, if, if we could say more about potential other incentives to get, get pharmaceutical companies to lower their prices, uh, like providing additional tax breaks or um, doing something out. Uh, some of the stuff that comes to mind for me would be like maybe some of the things that were incorporated in the Orphan Drug Act, where you you give people grants to do to do their research and stuff like that. Um, this person's at you know just generally asking like, well, could there be some other outside the box things we could do to change the financial incentives to lower drug prices? I'm willing to say that I cannot think of a, 
of a way to change the financial incentives. I think there may have to be some other kinds of incentives factored in, hence my last slide. I think actually there's an overwhelmingly strong financial case for extracting all, uh, you know, the rent seeking, <laughs> to talk a lot, the antitrust prosecutor that I was for all those years, to extract all the value you can. Um, and I'm hard pressed to think of anything that could be, be a true counterbalance to that, even things like the Orphan Drug Act, it's just nibbling at the edges, right? That's not really gonna change uh, I don't think in any profound way, market activity and the development or sale of prescription drugs. You know, it's outside the box, but also patent reform could potentially help because I think maybe that, I know there's lots of people making a lot of money trying to extend the patent six months or something like that, or extend exclusivity six months and a little minor tweak in the packaging of the drug, you get another five years of patent protection. So there might be ways to, I mean, again, obviously, I'm a little bit of the view that, that the, the innovators des deserve, maybe that's too strong a word, but um, it helps to, to, to allow them to extract some profits from the innovations they've developed, and we want these drugs in, in, out there. But I think there's there's a, there's enough around the edges stuff. I don't want anybody to go too far outside the box, and I thought maybe you guys might have one, but I mean, patent reform, um, we already talked about advertising, things like that. There's various things that could be done, I think, that could make it a little bit more palatable. And I think, you know, you're, you're bringing up the Orphan Drug Act, you know, that that's been manipulated as well. You know, now pharma is going after all these orphan drugs. And because, you know, these are very rare diseases and nobody has them and they have to recoup their research costs that are actually funded by taxpayers via the Orphan Drug Act. Uh, those, are, those drugs are among the most expensive approved. Um, because, you know, there's not many people available who need them to buy them. And so it's, it may benefit some areas and, and then, you know, be negative in other aspects. And maybe it's intentional, right? As if some people like some part of it, then maybe we can kind of keep these types of things going. Yeah, so um, I, I raise a question to my students in my pharmacoethics class of whether or not the Orphan Drug Act was too effective for the reasons that you have, have mentioned. Like it was too good at incentivizing uh, research into orphan, orphan diseases, or at least there's a case to be made uh, for that. Um, so John, you brought up the, the point about innovation again, and like incentivizing innovation. And there's at least one person who uh, attended this talk who totally agrees with you. Uh, and actually has just basically asked to Stephen and to, and to Anne, like, do you buy the argument that the justification for the prices is to encourage, um, you know, increased diversity of drugs and innovation and research and and stuff like that? I mean, I'm I'm paraphrasing a very long comment, but that's the that's the gist of it. Like, do you buy that argument, or would you have some reservations? I don't disagree that innovation might well take a hit. I don't think it's as large a hit as the fear mongers would say, but I don't disagree. And then if you remember John's remark and some of that innovation was what, you know, fairly inimical to controlling prescription drug pricing because it was a molecular tweak, a, you know, delivery system tweak, and then a killing of the other medication behind you. You have to understand how these migrations to the new patents work. Um, I, I am untroubled, okay, at some hit to innovation because demanding that we have always the best things for one small group of people in the United States and sometimes nothing for the rest is inimical to the values I spoke about, okay? It isn't possible to sustain what we have now, essentially a, maybe a three-tier healthcare system, okay, and have political stability, have social stability, grossly inequitable societies have instability. We are, we sowed the seeds, we're reaping the whirlwind. Okay, so I think that, you know, it's time to talk about, well, how can we be less grossly inequitable? And one of the ways probably has to be, well, maybe we can't be uh, carrying the uh, costs of the pharmaceutical industry for most of the world. Okay, <laughs> we, we have to, there, there is a leveling of access there too, and it's, we didn't even get into that, but maybe we need to sort of get our own house in order at home first. And so I'm untroubled. I do not think it will be like everyone will stop uh, working on prescription drugs tomorrow. Right, yeah, when you're talking about those kind of 
innovations in quotes, right? I think of the commercial we may all see right now for Humira Citrate Free. Humira is the number one prescription drug in the world, in the country, in anywhere. Um, but they were you know, potentially gonna lose some of their benefits. So they had to create a citrate free version that doesn't sting as much when it's injected into you. But it also stings your wallet a lot more. Maybe not directly because your pharmaceutical company or your, your insurance company covers that, but then it comes back to you in the form of higher premiums. You know, one, one other thing that I found just jaw dropping when it happened a few years ago, and I'm curious, um, Amory, if you saw this or what your comments or thoughts were, but when Allergan tried to sell Restasis to a Native American tribe to claim sovereign immunity to then leverage that to say that, you know, their patent then it was sovereign now that Allergan owned, that Native Americans owned it and was therefore not subject to U.S. patent law. I mean, I, I, my, I was both shocked, amazed, and appalled at the same time. I mean, it was so creative and so ingenious, but like so greedy and so wrong at the same time. It was so inappropriate on so many levels. It was legal genius of a sort, okay? But it was inappropriate um, both because is that really the goal to outsource everything, to offshore everything, okay? To get beyond territorial boundaries so that then, you know, uh, what is really not all that burdensome can then be avoided and give you a competitive advantage. It's also, you know, the unspoken tragedy of how desperate uh, one of the First Nations could be that they would allow themselves to be used in this way. I mean, they were simply gonna accept transference of ownership of the patent and just kind of hold it as like a corporate entity or whatever. Um, uh, how desperate their circumstances must be. And their circumstances are pretty bad. Um, and part of, you know, part of it tells that tale. I, yes, I do actually uh, talk about this. I talk about it in antitrust uh, more than I do in healthcare regulation because I do see it as, as a, a piece with, so market manipulation, the imperfect market uh, and the desire to distort it further. All right, so one, one uh, there's one kind of complex question. I don't know, I doubt we have enough time to go into all, all this in detail, but there's one person who asks about possibly the application of quality adjusted life years uh, to this. So. Um, they basically ask, uh, if you were trying to use a value-based pricing strategy, uh, could hospitals and other player, payers implement various willingness to pay cutoffs per quality adjusted life year? Um, could that system be useful in determining like some kind of pricing by including drugs and like the formula? Is there some way uh, that you could use that? They also ask um, how we might ethically determine what the cutoffs would be. Um, that I think is the would be the extremely hard question that you'd need a lot of empirical data to answer. Um, but do any of you all have thoughts on that? But using quality adjusted life years, putting that into drug pricing in some way. Yeah, I mean the data is out there and it can be calculated. And in fact, that's what many other countries do when they decide that this drug is quote not worth it. Um, but you know, in our country, there's not really support for that because everyone when it comes down to themselves or their loved ones, they want every measure to be spent, every dollar to be spent, you know, to save them or to help them. And that's, I feel like a deeply American feeling is it's more individualistic in its view than, than in the community level of what's really a standard for all. Um, and then there's some people who think there's a standard for everyone else, but then I'm the exception and I need, you know, to have this separate standard, but everyone feels that way. And, and that's why there, it just doesn't really work here. Um, because if, you know, let's say one player, one hospital tried, tried to do that, you still had, a, would have the drug on TV. You would have patients that could find out that this drug could be used for that disease. And if you're not going to give it to me, then I'll just drive down to the street to the next hospital that will. And you know, at the end of the day, if hospitals can, can make money by treating you with it, and they know if they don't treat you with it, you're gonna go somewhere else to get it. They, they don't wanna lose you or dissatisfy you as a customer slash patient. And so it's kind of the web that it weaves, but 
we have, you know, today many pharmaceuticals used in, in cancer that, you know, cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And the reality is that they extend life by, you know, a month. That's the reality today. In other countries, those drugs are illegal because they're not considered valuable enough, but they're available here and we're all paying for them, you know, through our insurance premiums and through Medicare. I think that that's all right. I think qualities are very interesting. And I agree that I think we would have enough data, but do we really have the will? But I also think that there are places where it could be injected into the current infrastructure. And you see a little bit, I'm not gonna say it's a quality, but you see a little bit of thinking about, wait a minute, is this really worth the bang for the buck? When you look at what Medicare coverage petitions, right? Uh, where that's an opportunity for a collective body to say, well, is this really something that ought to be, you know, <laughs> covered by Medicare? Right. And the problem is that that's been a very, very lax standard. But uh, I'm not sure it's a problem. The reality is that that's been a very lax standard. And yes, it is consistent with our values. I often say the real definition of American exceptionalism is not, you know, the complicated theory about how we're different from the rest of the world, but how each of us is special <laughs> and, and exempt from anything that might govern anyone else in the rest of our world. Um, so th that's what I think about that. I think qualities are really interesting. I think inevitably people who are concerned about these things end up discussing that. Maybe a half step toward that would be reference pricing, experiments with reference pricing, which is a way of saying, you know, what is the value of this pharmaceutical without having to enter into Americans just are going to have a very hard time with debating the value of a life. Even though it's implicit and sometimes explicit in everything we do. If you've never read the book, oh, What is a Life Worth? by uh, the amazing mediator who distributed the Congressional Fund after the Twin Towers disaster, you, you're really missing something in terms of how the law continuously, continually everywhere establishes a dollar value for life, but we will not admit this. So it looks like we have time for one more question. And there is one question in here, which kind of speaks to, I think a good note to end on, which is the, a question of sort of, um, what could we as members, like for the people in the audience who are not members of like the pharmaceutical industry or perhaps educators working in that area, like to what extent could a person who's a member of the general population, normal citizen, um, or perhaps a group of these people create pressures on the pharmaceutical industry that would actually lead to meaningful changes. Um, they suggest perhaps that social media and other like, you know, emerging networks um, for publicizing information may provide new channels for putting pressure uh, on big pharma to lower their drug prices. Uh, what do you all think about possibilities for change in the future? I feel like we might be at an inflection point. All right, because uh, we have a rare moment of consensus that maybe your health is my health and my health is that health. And, <laughs> and this is a rare moment, okay? Whoever said, you know, don't waste a good crisis. Uh, um, you know, things are very, very sober right now, but they had a point, okay? So maybe we're open to discussing. It would have to be a lot of education though. The average American probably doesn't understand very much at all about how a pharmaceutical actually gets into their hands. All they're, and, and I can't fault people, all they're really most responsive to is what price is it to me? Not what price is it to society? What price is it to anyone else? Just what is it to me? Maybe we all need to start outing what the real price is. And uh, I don't know, people taking snapshots of their, uh, <laughs> of their cash register receipts, right? Uh, and so that we can even understand, it's not unlike, uh, you know, uh, demand pricing in the airline industry. Everybody's paying a different price for that seat on that plane. And you know, that eight hours where you're stuck on the tarmac and so you played the game of going down the row and asking everybody what they paid. Everybody paid a different price and you paid the most. And that will, I think, uh, politicize you, uh, you know, motivate you to, uh, to start talking about, well, why is that so, right? Yeah, I think we threw out a couple of reasonable ideas about direct consumer advertising patent reform and things like that. I think that with the current, with the new administration, with bipartisan concern to, for drug pricing, probably the most effective use of time, I guess, in my mind would be the old fashioned contact your representative, <laughs> put pressure on them, get others to contact your representative, because it does seem like there's there's energy for some sort of change. And obviously uh, the solution is complicated, but, um, but that would be my opinion. 
you know, I would agree with everything everyone said. I think, you know, you have, you're doing your, your part by educating yourself by being here today. I think, you know, by being here today, you perhaps have an obligation to educate others, um, you know, and encourage them to, to reach out to the representatives, because if, if enough people don't think it's a problem and it will just, you know, continue to be the way that it is. All right, well, we have just hit 4.30, so I think we're gonna call it a close here. I wanna again thank our uh, panelists for coming here and sharing their thoughts. Uh, so that was uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Marciarelli, Stephen uh, Laboric, and John Gray. And I wanna thank the Center for Ethics Human Values and the College of Pharmacy at Ohio State University for sponsoring this talk. Uh, I also wanna thank, of course, you and the audience for sticking this out, spending some time on your Friday afternoon um, um, watching this conversation, participating, asking questions. Uh, I hope you will check out other events that the Center for Human, Center for Ethics, Human Values puts on in the future. And if you happen to be watching this on YouTube in the future, uh, I hope you will check out some of the other uh, webinars and things that we've recorded on that channel. Thanks everybody for watching. Have a good rest of your day.